Uh, have you read uh, The Plague by Camus by any chance? Years ago. <laughs> Years ago. So, I have to re read it again. That's it, really relevant. Well, yeah. let me just sort of ask you a question about it. it. It describes a town that's overtaken by a plague and it's blocked off from the rest of the world. And it kind of reveals the best and worst of human nature. That's like how people respond to that, sort of the encroaching the, their own mortality, mm -hmm. their own death on, on the horizon. I think one of the messages in the book that ultimately like love for others. So it's like a lot of people want to become isolated and they hide from each other, but mm -hmm. ultimately the thing that saves you is, is, is love, which is one of the things I've just watching this pandemic, you know, with the distance, with the masks, that's all fine, but there's a distancing from people of that, 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 um, the tension, the breaking of the common humanity between people. That's one of the reasons I, when I came to Austin earlier this year, just to, to visit, I fell in love with the city because even with the masks and the distance, mm. there was still um, a, a camaraderie, like a, like a, I don't know, just a love for each other, just a kindness towards each other. And uh, that's what I took away from the plague. Um, mostly it's told the story of the doctor who basically, gives in and uh, just gives himself as a service to others. And that, that love is, is the thing that liberates him from his own conception of mortality. The fact that he's here, he's going to die. Mm. What do you think about this, the effect of the virus? We talked a lot about biology, but the effect of the virus on the, the, the fabric of the common humanity that connects us. Well, that's what a pandemic does. It really, cuts that, right? Because small outbreaks are local, they don't have global effects. But when you have something this big, where pretty much nobody escapes, and not just making people sick, it changes your life, right? People lose jobs, they change jobs, they move somewhere else. They have all kinds of disruptions. You know, kids can't go to school. It really shows you. I mean, I always like to say, a tiny virus can bring earth to its knees. A tiny virus that you can't even see them that most people don't even think about most of the time. And the real effect is not just sickness, it's what it does to people because uh, in the end we are animals and most animals like each other and they interact, they have great social structures and that makes them do well. Uh, and it, I guess the exception is people in AI, right? <laughs> they, could be, they could be on their own. <laughs> well, that's why you build robots that you fall in love with. That's right. And so I think when a, when a, the real story is what it does to society for sure, which has ramifications way beyond the number of people dying and the vaccines and the tests and all of that. And this one has really made a big rupture. And you could tell not now so much, I think being out and about now, things look pretty normal except you know for some people wearing masks you would never never know i mean the airport this morning was completely jammed people going and they're all on vacation they're all wearing shorts right mm -hmm. so they're they're back to normal it's august but last year is really different in new york where you're used to lots of people on the street it was eerie it was just quiet but you know under it all people are still most people help each other when they have to right most people are willing to, uh, if something happens to someone, to reach out and help them. You know, there are always exceptions where people are mean, and that's, you know, that's just the way animals are. We're not the only ones that can be mean to our own species. Yeah. But I think most of the motivation for everything that was done is to help other people. I mean, I, th I do think that the vaccine manufacturers, maybe not the leaders, but the people working in the labs really wanted to get this out. Mm -hmm. quickly and help, help people, people. Yeah. right? Yeah, I think at every level, people who are contributing really wanted to help other people and, and feel proud that they're able to do that. So there's, I view it as, you know, we're never going to be 100% good because animals are not. Evolution made us, I mean, we're, we're lucky we somehow rose above by having incredible brain and so forth. But a lot of our base instincts are animals. And, you know, they chase each other and and have alpha males and all that stuff. And, and we always have a little bit of that in us, but we do have some uh, humanity that this really 
ripped up. It really did. And I think for me, someone who studied viruses for over 40 years, it's just amazing that an invisible thing can do that, right? It, it goes back to the thing you found fascinating, which is a virus affecting human behavior. Yes. Or uh, behavior of the organism. <laughs> yes. So, you know, humans can make weapons and do harm and you can see that, but this you can't even see. Yeah. You can't, and look what it has done. And it'll do it again. There'll be more. I just, I wish we would be more prepared because we know what to do. We know we should be making antivirals, vaccines, masks, testing masks, making test mod uh, modalities that we can really quickly redesign. But after SARS-1, all that went out the door. People didn't do anything, and that's why we're in this situation. So, I, you know, people ask me this all the time. Are we going to be ready for the next one? And I always say we should be. We have all the information we need to know what to do. But somehow I think people forget uh, that said, sometimes uh, we st we really step up <laughs> when the tragedy is right in front of us. We do. When the catastrophe. So I don't know. Somehow humans have still survived. The fact that we had nuclear weapons for so many decades and we still have not blown each other up, whether by terrorists or by nation, is, it's amazing. is, is quite surprising. <laughs> That's <laughs> so. always, after reading the Pentagon Papers, it's even more amazing, right? <laughs> so I don't know how we do it. I, I tend to believe it's there's... Uh, there's that, you know, at the surface, you notice the greed, the corruption, the the evil, but the core of human nature, of the human spirit is is uh, one in the scientific realm is curiosity mm -hmm. and more deeply is, is kindness, compassion, and like wanting to do good for the world. Like I, I believe that desire to do good outpowers all the other stuff uh, by a large amount. And that's why we don't, we have not yet destroyed ourselves. We kind of, there's a lot of bickering. There's a lot of wars on the surface, but underneath it all, there's there's this ocean of, of uh, uh, love for each other. I mean, I think there's a evolutionary advantage to that. <laughs> and uh, it, it would be a good explanation why we still haven't destroyed ourselves. Oh, we had so many opportunities. Yeah. If you look at all the wars in history, so many. Yeah. I was just, my son was, telling me about the Ottoman Empire, right? I mean, it's just, you know, war after war, and then other countries splitting up countries with no regard to who's living where, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, how, how can these people do this? Yeah, <laughs> it's fascinating. Human history is fascinating, and we're still young as a species. We have a lot- They're very young, yeah. More time to go and a lot more ways to destroy ourselves. 